Hey y'all, Coach Nafai here, asking the question, what is the golden calf? Now, in a recent video we put out for the calendar of the eighth sacred month, we talked about in it how the 15th day of the eighth month was the day that Jeroboam set up the golden calf in the tribes of Dan and in Bethel. Even though it was a class about the eighth month, we went into great detail about Dan and why he was missing from the 144,000. The reason being that they were worshiping this golden calf. Even until recently, as you can see here, this image of the altar that's still in Dan till this day. This is the altar that we read about over there in 1 Kings chapter 12, where Verse 32 and 33 talks about how Jeroboam set up this golden calf to be worshipped on the 15th day of the 8th month. We find out back in verse 27 that the reason why he did this was so that the people would not worship the one true God, the Almighty, our Father in heaven, hallowed be his name. He took it upon himself to build a golden calf so that the people would worship this false God instead. Now, of course, the first place we hear about the golden calf is back there in Exodus chapter 32, when Aaron set up a golden calf at the request of the people who had came out of Egypt with him and Moses. And we understand that to be a living parable. But what does that mean today? When we look at the Third Testament of the Bible in chapter 64, which is all about prophecies, looking particularly at the prophecy given to the United States, Verse 23 says, when will my seed put down roots in you? When will you topple your golden calf and your tower of Babel so that you may build the true temple of the Lord, implying that we are still yet today worshiping the golden calf? Now, I understand that they put a big statue of a bronze bull there in Wall Street. Is that the golden calf? Well, in this video, we're going to look at the scriptures coming not only from the Third Testament of the Bible, but coming from the great book of true life to get an understanding of what the golden calf is. If you're new to this channel, you may also be new to the Third Testament of the Bible, which is a compendium of the teachings of divine revelations contained in the 12 volumes of the book of true life. In other words, the book we know as the third testament of the bible is a collection of different topics and passages from a greater work called the book of true life i'll offer you a link to all 12 volumes down in the description of this video but what i have here is a word document where i've put all 12 volumes into one text file and what we're going to do is look down through all 12 volumes at the 19 times that the word calf is used if they're related to the golden calf. I believe that's the only time that we're gonna see the word calf is in relationship to the golden calf. But if I'm wrong, we'll probably just glance at it because what we're doing is looking for specifically the golden calf and what it says. Now, the first time we see it mentioned is in teaching 13. Where in verse 38 says, remind mankind that each time I have come to them, I have found them distracted by what is mundane. And that is why they have not felt my presence. So we're going to break some of this down. Like, for instance, how it's talking about each time that he has come to us. This is talking about the Shekinah glory that comes down every 490 years. It's actually coming up on us now, which is why a lot of people may be seeing the Merkaba or those lights in the sky. But anyway, it says, but how could they be able to wait for such a long time since you, my people, gave indication of your impatience when you left Egypt and could not wait just a few more days for the return of Moses? Referring back to what we read there in Exodus. And what this is saying is that we're doing the same thing now. Instead of waiting for our, our Messiah to return, we've gotten distracted yet once again. It says, when he descended from Mount Sinai, carrying the tables of the law, he found the people devoted to an idolatrous worship. 
And I'm sure no one would be surprised that, that humanity is yet now devoted to an idolatrous worship. But like I said, the purpose of this video is to find out exactly what that idolatrous worship is. Verse 38 continues and says, In only a few moments of weakness, they had erased the name of the true God from their hearts to substitute him for a golden calf. Now, understanding back there with Aaron and Moses was a living parable. I believe it's safe to assume that we have done just this now, where humanity has substituted his name for the golden calf. The only question is, what is the golden calf? But notice how important it is for us to figure this out, what the golden calf is exactly. You see up there, it says that the worship of this golden calf is the reason why we can't feel his presence. So whatever this is, is actually blocking us, acting as a barrier between us and the most high. So as we step through these verses, try to understand what the golden calf is. Because at the end of the video, I'm going to ask you for your opinion of what the golden calf is. I mean, I'm going to show you all of the verses that talks about it. But then I'm going to ask for your opinion on the conclusion as to what it actually is. Let's look at verse 39. It says, it was then that the Lord called those people hard of understanding. For that reason, it does not surprise me that after an era, I find that men, although they have my promise, would weaken in their faith, that they would let their lamps be extinguished and in my place substitute so many idols which they worship today. So the golden calf is one of the idols in which we worship today. Would it be possible for them to recognize me now that I have come among them? It is natural that all that is mine would seem strange to them. And you have to remember like Jeroboam was doing. He was trying to keep us away from the most high God and keep our attention on the golden calf instead. So this modern day idolatrous worship would be doing the exact same thing. But let's go on down to teaching 15. Where in verse 13, we see the second time the phrase golden calf is mentioned. And it says, it will be then when the golden calf is destroyed forever. When all useless sacrifices are abolished. When the spiritual benefits will no longer be the object of profit. And which you will not exchange for earthly benefits. So here I believe is a clue as to what the golden calf is. Useless sacrifices and earthly benefits that we have substituted for spiritual benefits. It says it will be when man has attained a complete evolution of his spirit and will learn to respect within himself the precious gifts with which the father has endowed him since the beginning of his creation. Talking about these spiritual benefits is saying that the spiritual benefits are no longer the object of profit but we've exchanged them for earthly benefits, which includes useless sacrifices. Well, let's come back up here to verse 12. It says the struggle of my disciples in this era to enable them to establish my law on earth will be greater than ever in order for spirituality to reign in the world for which ordinates all justice, all love and reason. All the people and nations of the world will first have to drink a very bitter cup. And this reminds me of how Moses had them to drink that golden calf after he beat it into dust and put it in the water. So what this is saying, I believe, is once again, the golden calf will be beat into dust and we will have to drink that bitter potion. Now, the next time we see the word golden calf is in teaching 35. Down in about verse 58, which says, Would not your spirit and your heart be filled with joy if, through your love, those people who are spiritually enlightened and attached to their traditions were able to be converted to the Marian Trinitarian spiritual doctrine? Now, the Third Testament talks about this Marian Trinitarian spiritualist doctrine as kind of the new doctrine going forward. 
where all of the other false religions have failed. The Marian part points to how we will recognize our universal mother. The Trinitarian part talks about how we will recognize all three doctrines or all three testaments, the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Third Testament. And the spiritualist part is talking about how we will communicate spiritually with our father. But anyway, we've done classes on that. It says, would there not be a joy among you if the people of old Israel were shown the true path by the people of new Israel? That is to say that the first would attain grace through the last. Now, the people of old Israel would be those who only really recognize the Old Testament. But we have to understand that we need all three testaments, just like we have to have the New Testament. We have to have the Third Testament in order to get a full understanding of what our father is trying to tell us. So what this is saying is those who are recognizing the Third Testament, wouldn't it be great if they could go back and help those who only recognize the Old Testament or only recognize the New Testament to understand what our father truly expects of us. It says, up until now, nothing has convinced the Jewish people that it should break ancient traditions in order to reach its moral and spiritual evolution. Again, this is talking about the people who only recognize the Old Testament. These are the people who believe that they are following the laws of Jehovah and of Moses, but who in reality still continue to worship the golden calf. So these people thinking that they are worshiping Yahuwah, the most high God, and following the laws of Moses are still worshiping the golden calf. So this is why we're doing this class, trying to figure out what does it mean here? How is this possible that there are people yet today who believe that they are following the laws and following the Most High God, our Creator, are still worshiping the golden calf? And I believe the answer is, is that we don't really know what this golden calf is today. This could be a problem because we could be doing this and not even know it. It's like having the mark of the beast. If you don't know what the mark of the beast is, then you can't be sure that you don't have it. So let's continue. It says the time is near for those wandering people scattered throughout the world to cease to look toward earth and to elevate their eyes toward heaven in search of the one who from the beginning was promised as their savior. So the golden calf is in the opposite of our savior. But we understand that from what Jeroboam was trying to do. It says in the second era, they rejected him and killed him because they thought he was poor and that he had nothing to offer. So is the golden calf have something to do with the opposite of being poor? But before we leave this verse, notice how it's saying here the Jewish people and how they believe that they're following the laws of Moses, but are still worshiping the golden calf. By the time we get to the end of this video, we'll have a lot of ideas on what the golden calf is. But could this be talking about Jeroboam and how he got the people to worship on the wrong day? That's the problem with the Jewish calendar. Since it's not a biblical calendar, it's only biblical-ish. The Jewish holidays don't fall on the correct day. They're usually off by at least a day. So could this be what is meant by they think they're following the laws but yet are worshiping the golden calf by celebrating their feast days according to the Jewish calendar instead of the biblical calendar. I'm hoping by pulling these verses out that we can figure this out together. So if you believe you know already, please add it down in the comment section. I'm gonna go on because I don't quite see the smoking gun yet. And we're gonna look down here in teaching 65 where verse 30 says, the trial draws near and for that purpose, I am preparing you. This is talking about the third temple that will be built on our hearts. He's saying that we're almost there yet. The new covenant as we hear about, it says, it is time for you to walk with a firm step without fear. You are Israel and that name signifies strength. Understanding that Israel is not talking about bloodlines, but the people who obey the laws are those who are known as Israel. But anyway, it says, 
That blessed seed has always existed in your spirit. Talking about how everybody has the calling, no matter what race you're in. The thing about it, true Israel will be those who are answered that call. It says, the true prayer confronts your spirit, purifies your blemishes, consoles you when you are sad, accompanies you in your orphanhood, and turns you away from temptations. Talking about true prayer here, and we've done many classes on this. Maybe I'll give you guys a link to a playlist on true prayer at the end of this video. Because prayer is not really taught in our churches, turns out many of us really don't know how to do it. And that's the reason why our prayers go unanswered. If you don't get to check out that playlist, just remember the Lord's Prayer and say that prayer three times a day, just like it's written. But anyway, it says, and in the manner that I have taught you to pray from spirit to spirit, to be strong in life, also during the moment of death, elevate your spirit to me through that blessed ascending ladder of the prayer. Yeah, prayer is really important. But like I said, we're not getting it right. We're missing key elements. We're saying things like God. And anyway, check out the video. Or like I said, just use the Lord's Prayer as a template. How distant mankind lives from the true prayer. How few are those who know how to practice it. Spiritually, mankind lives like the men of ancient times. They worship towards the golden calf. Their cult toward pagan gods still exists. So now I believe this is another hint. That the golden calf has something to do with pagan god worship. It says, The Tower of Babel of the men of science of these times defies my divine justice at every moment. Now, here is talking about the Tower of Babel. So, we have in one verse both the golden calf and the Tower of Babel, like the verse we started off with. Back there talking about the prophecy given to the United States. It says, when will you topple your golden calf and your tower of Babel? So from this verse, the golden calf is the cult towards pagan god worship, which would be the mark of the beast, as we talked about in a previous class. And the tower of Babel would be pointing to our doctors in pharmacia, the men of science, or maybe it's talking about organizations like CERN or somebody. The thing about the scientists of the world, and I went to school with them as I was studying engineering, so I know how it is firsthand, how they're trying to remove our father from the science. Many of the experiments that they do are trying to disprove our father altogether, acting like he had nothing to do with our creation or that he doesn't exist. Sounds like the Tower of Babel to me. I don't know. Let's keep going. Teaching 74, verse 33 says, Just as the golden calf was abolished during that time, so will the love for wealth disappear. And the same way the money changers were cast out of the temple, so will now those be touched who, taking advantage of the weakness and ignorance, profit by the suffering of their fellow man. Now, so this is why I'm hesitant to believe that the golden calf simply boils down to pagan god worship and holidays and such, because it seems to apply that it has something to do with wealth and the pursuit of happiness or our desire to gain riches or something like that. But what this is talking about is the apocalypse here and how all of the wealth of the world is going to be destroyed in the global earthquake. We see that mentioned in verse 32, where it says a light touch or a light gust of the elements. It seems to be saying that that gust of the elements is going to cause the love of wealth to disappear. Casting out the money changers out of today's temple. And then notice right here it says, so will now those be touched who taking advantage of the weakness and ignorance profit by the suffering of their fellow man. This is talking about how people have to keep us ignorant in order to profit from us. Like, for instance, our doctors, they can't really tell us how medicine works and how to heal our bodies, else they're going to lose us as patients. The lawyers, 
if we understand how the law works, we're not going to depend on them. And so they're going to lose income. That, that goes for everybody. Even the mechanic doesn't want you to know how to fix the brakes or change the spark plugs in your car. The preacher man doesn't want you to read your Bible, else you're going to stop coming to church. It's like the whole world profits off of ignorance. But anyway, we're going to jump down here to teaching 122, looking at verse 57, which says, I come to rebuild my temple, a temple without walls or towers, because it is in the heart of men. Talking about the third temple and how we will be the stones that make up that temple. It says the Tower of Babel still divides humanity, but its foundations will be destroyed in the hearts of men. And we know the Tower of Babel from above has something to do with science. It says the idolatry and religious fanaticism has also raised their high towers, but they are weak and will have to fall. It's just talking about how all of the walls of the churches will fall during the global earthquake. Truly, I tell you, my laws, both divine and human, are sacred, and they themselves will judge the world. And this is important to understand how it's saying the laws will judge the world. You know, we, whenever we're thinking about laws or hearing somebody talk about laws telling us that we shouldn't be obeying the laws, we, we should substitute the word instructions. The laws are the instructions. And so, you know, what they're saying is that we don't need the instructions for surviving the tribulation. Well, if we don't have the instructions for surviving, then you have no plans on surviving. That's, that's what the laws are there for, to teach us how to survive. And anybody who rejects those laws or those instructions have no intention on doing so. But anyway, it says mankind does not believe to be idolatrous. And truly, I tell you that it is still worshiping the golden calf. Then it goes on to talk about how I am spirit. I am the essence of light. Wake up and open your eyes. Look at me and listen to my voice. And we saw this a little bit earlier where it was saying that, that we still are still looking for material benefits and useless sacrifices. Now we're going to jump down to teaching 127, where we see the prophecy given to the United States. Verse 59 reads a little bit differently. It says, go on, but I ask you, when will my seed take root deeply in you? When will you collapse your golden calf and your tower of Babel to build my true temple? So, so far, we understand that it has something to do with pagan God worship, maybe has something to do with wealth, talking about the golden calf and the Tower of Babel has something to do with the men of science. These both being interference or distractions from the third temple. It's necessary to get rid of both of those if we want to enjoy the new covenant. Now, down here in teaching 130, Verse 11 mentions the golden calf. It says, among my people, there have always been those who feel spirituality as well as those who only pursue material goods. In the first era, there were times when some worshiped the golden calf, others wept in fear for Jehovah. And in the second, in the bosom of my apostles was one who aspired to receive from me the power to turn the stones into gold, claiming that it was good to help the poor who hunger with money. To which I said, giving money to the crowds would make them not appreciate it because it is easy to obtain. Again, making a connection between the golden calf and money. So where is this book where one of the apostles wanted to be able to turn stones into gold? I don't remember reading that in any other text. So if you know about it, please tell us about it in the comment section. Surely that book would hold a lot of additional clues. But anyway, it's probably in the basement of the Vatican somewhere. Down here in verse 55 is saying, although you have received my law, you are still practicing idolatry. You are still worshiping the golden calf without realizing it. And this is like we talked about earlier. We just don't know what it is. We're getting some hints here. But I think we are dying because of a lack of knowledge. Verse 24 says down here, Since the first era, I have given you a spiritual shepherd to guide you. That shepherd has served as my forerunner and messenger prior to my arrival among the multitude. This is talking about Elijah and the comforting spirit. 
It says, because you have ignored my teachings due to your spiritual ignorance, you are still worshiping the golden calf and other material things. So we had learned in Malachi chapter four that we have to obey the law in order to have the indwelling of the Elijah spirit for that comforter to come among us. But how many of us don't obey the law? So we're in pursuit of material things as the replacement for the Elijah spirit. Again, making me believe that it has something to do with the acquisition of wealth. Now, the 11th time golden calf is mentioned, just talking about a topic which we cover in verse 55. The next time we see it mentioned is down here in verse 29. It says the people of Israel are not yet gathered because while some are in spirit, others still have flesh. While some are saved, others are on the brink of the abyss. Among these are those believing they love the father whom they adore is the golden calf. But the moment is approaching when these people find yourselves assembled and prepared. Again, talking about our ignorance of what the golden calf is. Verse 107 says, How bless those who turn from their mistakes to come down the path of spirituality. How bless those who renounce your idols and those who haven't danced around the golden calf. Leave their materiality and take up the cross of spirituality. This one is talking about pagan God worship, I believe here, talking about holidays and how we're dancing around the golden calf. 51 says a land of promise awaits you, but you are still distant from her. You go across the vast desert. You left behind the slavery of Pharaoh and you have already received the law. However, you have not completely abandoned it, the idolatry and without realizing it, you sometimes worship the golden calf. So this is putting the law in opposition of the golden calf. I guess this one can go both ways. It could be talking about material wealth acquisition, but it could also be talking about material God worship too. Verse 55 has two times that it mentions the golden calf. It says, my people, I ask you to remove the golden calf that you are still worshiping. Although men believe that he no longer practices idolatry nor paganism, he continues to worship the golden calf. So here's a direct connection saying idolatry and paganism is the golden calf, which makes sense when you understand how our economies are based on holiday worship. That's why our presidents are so into the holidays. That's how they keep the government's function. That's how they've gained wealth throughout history is by keeping people into the pagan God worship. That's why they had such a problem with the Messiah. One of the reasons was by turning people back to our father, it would actually put in jeopardy the economy because people would stop worshiping the golden calf. Hmm. That one was found down in teaching 255. Let's read 54. It says, those who practice spirituality are responsible for eliminating the barrier that humanity has created between itself and God. Man has created a barrier of false faith, materialism, lavish forms of worship, and inaccurate beliefs about the eternal. So this would make me believe that the golden calf lives down there at the church, where we're hearing about inaccurate beliefs about the eternal, false faith, materialism, lavish forms of worship. This sounds like modern day selfianity to me. Anyway, down here in verse 22, we're seeing a repeat where it says, it is the people who are apparently conformed to the laws of Jehovah and Moses, but in reality continue to worship the golden calf. The time is near when the wandering people scattered throughout the world stop looking towards the earth We've, we've saw that one before. And that's the thing about the great book of life is it's a bunch of lessons um, when we would consider them sermons or something like that. And they tend to repeat themselves. Not too often. This book is of a great value, but there are some things that are repetitive in it. Let's come down to teaching 343 where verse 11 says, I have given you the light, the teachings, and my mandates in the Third Testament that together with the first and second, they form a single teaching of love and charity so that men love one another. 
so that they no longer forge again the golden calf, nor feed fanaticism and idolatry, which is what has kept you from the true path. This, I believe, is talking more about the Third Testament and how it makes the complete set. You have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Third Testament. These form, like it says, they're a single doctrine. Anybody who, who's read the Third Testament, even parts of it, understand that, that it's breaking down the other two books for us, helping us to get an understanding of what we've learned in the Old Testament and the New Testament. This, this Third Testament is necessary. And the last time we're going to see the golden calf is down here in teaching 344, where verse 25 says, With great love and patience I have come to pick you up from the mud, from different ideologies, from idolatry, because you had bowed before the effigies, before the golden calf. So this is saying that the golden calf is an effigy, and we'll have to look that word up sculpture or a model of a person so this is talking about the idol itself so this could be pointing to the image of the christ being the golden calf which we haven't really thought about that one in this video how that picture that they idolize calling it the messiah who's really just a picture of the pope's son is the golden calf or at least the effigies that makes up part of the idolatry. How much misunderstanding has existed in all times, but I, as light, as charity and love, I have always manifested myself to you so that you do not walk blindly. So, what do you think the golden calf is? We've looked at all 19 times the word calf is mentioned here in the great book of life. This would include the four times we see it in the Third Testament of the Bible itself. We've covered all of these. So I ask you guys, what do you believe that the golden calf is? Based on what we learned here, we have three, maybe four choices. We have wealth or material gain. We have effigies like statues. But we've talked a lot about pagan god worship. And maybe one more. So, what do you think? What is the golden calf? And even the Tower of Babel. What do you believe it is? Let me know in the comment section. And I'll see you there.